Well, good morning, everybody. I think that the <laughs> adult Sunday school teacher actually got done early today, and so we actually had lots of time to do everything we needed, and we actually started service a minute early. That's like a miracle. That never happens. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. Thanks for coming today. I'm glad that the snow did not keep anybody away, at least those who are here present with us today. And if you're at home today because of the snow, thank you for joining us online and trust that you are blessed through the service that you get to watch and uh, pray that you are joining us in spirit as well. And so thank you for everybody for coming. It's a wonderful day, wonderful opportunity to be together in the house of the Lord, to hear from his word, to worship him together. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. Today, of course, is uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday. It is January 23rd, and that is the day of the famous Supreme Court ruling 49 years ago. Uh, and so we are going to be talking about that later today, but it's also a reminder for us to be aware of uh, what is happening in our culture and in our nation, and to be praying against uh, that decision, and praying that hearts and minds and lives would be changed, and lives would be saved uh, above all. And so there is some hope with that coming in the future with the current Supreme Court case, but uh, legally at least, and so we pray that God's will would be done, and we want to keep that as a matter of prayer as well. But today we're here to honor the Lord and to hear from Him and His Word, and so we're here to uh, seek His face and to give Him praise and glory. Before we get into our full service today, let's uh, just be reminded of a couple of uh, prayer requests and announcements. Uh, first of all, some prayer requests continue to be with Stephen, Shirley's grandson, and be praying for him. This is all in your bulletin, by the way. I'm reading towards the end at the bottom here. Uh, Steve, a friend of the Wants's, uh, is struggling with COVID, and he's got kidney dialysis and all that kind of stuff, and so he's really having a rough time. Although, when we heard from Dave on Tuesday, uh, Steve, was imp Steve was improving, but still in a not a great place. Um, and then we want to pray for Gail. She just couldn't let Joey, you know, be the only, you know, one that had an issue this week. So uh, Gail kind of slipped and fell some ice, and she's got a, a broken wrist, correct? So pray for Gail and Joey as they care for each other over these next few weeks. Don't forget our missionaries from the NAB, uh, Paul and Tanya, as they are serving in Romania. Just heard this week from uh, Randy, who is the NAB Gateway Missions Coordinator, and he was talking about some changes that are going to be happening in NAB ministries in Eastern Europe. Uh, just time for some retirements and some health things. And so uh, things are changing over there. So be praying for NAB missions in Eastern Europe. Uh, they would greatly appreciate that. Um, as far as I know, that's all of our new and updated prayer requests for today. Uh, please do keep in mind that there will be prayer tonight at 630 Tuesday night, we will have our Active Faith Bible study, beginning to wrap up our study on God's will, uh, appreciating that. Um, next Sunday is, of course, our annual business meeting, and there is going to be one new item of business, just want to make everybody aware of, that we're going to be voting in a new member. The, uh, Mike and I will be recommending uh, two new members for our church this coming Sunday, so uh, be praying about the meeting and about that opportunity as well. Uh, then it's time to say yay or nay, if you can, uh, about the No Regrets Men's Conference. Press on. We'll host it here at the church. We'll order some lunch from Pizza Ranch, and we'll have some goodies on hand. But it's a wonderful opportunity for men to hear from uh, God's Word about uh, men and how to be a godly man, be a good leader in our home and in our churches and in our communities, being godly men for Christ. And so this uh, promises to be another exciting year and uh, looking forward to that opportunity. Please let me know if you're going to attend. That way we know how much pizza to, to take. If you've got to come and go in between, that's fine. Um, but uh, the church has paid for the registration, and we'll cover the pizza as well. And if you want to give a love offering towards that, that would be much appreciated. And then for our young people, but anybody really, but especially our young people, teens and young adults, college-age students, the Reality Student Conference coming up at the end of February. just want to make you aware of that so you can plan on it. A uh, wonderful opportunity for our students to hear from some of the greatest voices and minds uh, on apologetics in our country today. Um, good men and women who are going to teach good, solid biblical truth and help us to think through these things and to be able to talk with those in our culture who stand against some of the major issues of our day. And so especially to help our young people to stand firm in the gospel um, with some of these issues that are happening in our world. 
So good opportunities for ministry and growth, and trust that you will be able to take full advantage of all of those. If I haven't forgotten anything this morning, um, we will continue on with our service today. Shirley? Um, my sister Moselle. Oh yes, please pray for Culver. Shirley's sister Moselle and Colbert. She was quite sick for a while and possibly left unattended and did not receive the help that she needed right away. So she's in the hospital now. Yeah. Uh, getting care. So pray that that care would uh, be what she needs to get her back home very soon. Thank you. Forgive me for that. At this time, let's go into a time of prayer. Father, we thank you for bringing us together once again this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to share this uh, service and this message through uh, the internet to those who are interested in wanting to join us online. We pray that you would be with each one of them, that uh, they would uh, feel a connection to you and to our gathering here today, that they would be able to hear and worship at home and hear your word and be edified by that today. We do pray, Father, that you would be with each one of us. We thank you for your continued blessings, for your uh, provision and for your protection. We thank you especially for a warm building to meet in and an opportunity to meet freely and uh, to share God's truth uh, so that people can know you and walk in your ways. We pray that you would help us to not just communicate that truth here each Sunday, but every day, uh, throughout our weeks, as we interact with people that you bring across our path. We thank you, Father, once again, for your grace, for your mercy, for your compassion, for giving us your Son, that we might have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. We thank you for calling us to faith in him, and trust that you will continue to lead us to live lives that would give you honor and glory. Father, this morning we do pray for uh, Mozilla. We Pray that you would heal her and strengthen her. And we pray for Gail and Joey and that you would heal their um, shoulder and wrist and their injuries. We pray for um, those who are not able to be with us for other health reasons. And we pray that you would just strengthen them and encourage their hearts and minds. We do pray, Father, this morning for uh, Paul and Tanya and uh, those serving in the NAB and other missionaries as well, uh, sharing the gospel through Eastern Europe. And we pray that you would bless them, provide for their needs. We pray that they would see much fruit from their ministry and their labors. We do pray, Father, this morning for our nation. Uh, there are many ills and sins uh, in our nation and that our nation is committing. We pray that you would bring repentance, that you would bring forgiveness uh, through faith in Christ. And we pray that you would bring an end to uh, certain things that are just, um, just horrible situations in our country and around the world, in fact. We pray, Father, against abortion. We pray that you would help uh, those who feel that that is their only choice, that you would provide them with the courage and the boldness to choose other ways and other means, uh, that life would be protected at all ages and stages. We pray that your will would be done there, and that all who seek help and need help would be able to find it, especially through your church. May we continue to be a place of compassion and grace and mercy and help uh, when it is needed. Father, we do pray this morning as well for the persecuted church. Uh, the recently, Father, a new report was given out that Afghanistan is now the one place in the world where Christians are most persecuted. And we pray that you would protect them there, that you would bless them, that you would help them to continue to minister and serve one another and to share the gospel uh, despite the dangers that they face. We pray that they would be encouraged uh, by their faith in Christ, that you would bring your word to them, that you would bring... Uh, encouragement and that you would bring peace through their ministry and through the gospel to that troubled nation. We pray, Father, as well, uh, these same things for uh, the persecuted church scattered around the world. We pray that churches within our community, uh, here at North Freedom and in Reedsburg, Rock Springs, and Baraboo, that we would stand firm upon your word, sharing the gospel, uh, despite the pressures that are happening even in our own land and in our own communities. Above all, Father, we pray that you would help each one of us to give you honor and glory and praise. Pray that you would work in us and through us today. In Jesus' name, amen. This time I'll call those who are going to participate in our praise and worship today, leading our service, uh, to come to uh, the front here as we stand and prepare to honor the Lord and begin our time of worship through a call to worship today. Join me, please. Let us recite together Psalm 89, verses 1 and 2. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. 
With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you establish your faithfulness in heaven itself. Let us sing of the mercies of the Lord. John chapter 9, verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been born blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? 
So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been born blind, that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are his, this fellow's disciple? We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. We just uh, heard a message on this a couple weeks ago, so I'm not going to dwell on these uh, verses too often, but the reaction of those who do not believe insults and anger and throwing people out because God has done something glorious and they do not understand it. They did not want to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ, the one who would come and bring healing and bring forgiveness of sins through the cross. This is the Jesus that loves us and came to earth to die for us. And he loves all that they might come to know him through repentance and faith in him and his work on the cross. Let us sing of this Savior of ours, hymn number 357, Jesus Loves Even Me, verses 1 and 2. Stand with me if you're able. <laughs> about uh, today and over the next couple of weeks many of the 
ideological issues that are prevalent in our society and in our world and approach them from the Word of God. Not going to necessarily spend a whole lot of time picking them apart. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a. Uh, I'm not an apologist, really. I, I sometimes I just have a hard time picking apart arguments and fallacies and logical things that just aren't quite right. I do trust in others uh, to make those arguments and teachings uh, for me because I just don't always think that way. Um, so I apologize if you're thinking that we're going to get a lot of good apologetic stuff, but I'm going to do what I've been called to do, which is to present the truth from God's Word. Not that apologists don't do that, but I'm just going to go to chapter and verse and say, this is what God's Word says, and this is how we are to live it out. And so we're going to begin today by taking every thought captive, in this series, taking every thought captive, begin by looking at um, defending life. Because unfortunately, life is not defended in our nation and in our world as much as people would like to think that it is. So I'm going to begin with a word of prayer, begging the Lord to guide and direct my words today, because if there's one message you don't want to misspoke, misspeak, it's this one. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to guide us today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to get into it and to study it and to proclaim it and to live it according to the power of your spirit. I thank you for this opportunity to share this message today. I pray that you would speak through me, help me to speak slowly and calmly with intent of your heart, which you have communicated to us in your word, that we might know you, that we might know who we are, and how we are to live before you. Father, I do pray today for those who have been affected by this topic in whatever way, shape, or form. I pray that you would bring your grace and your mercy upon them that they might walk in your truth and in your forgiveness and in your blessing, knowing that you are a God of grace and compassion and love. And I pray that as I share these principles, that I would emphasize your grace and your truth today in a manner that brings you honor and glory and helps all of us to walk according to your ways. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Defending life. 49 years ago today, pro-abortion ideology became mainstream in American politics and culture. And I'm not going to go into all the details about that because I believe most of us are aware of those details. But this ideology, this viewpoint, this worldview, this way of behaving and thinking is born of a secular, non-religious worldview. It does not truly value all human life, even though it claims to but believes that unborn human beings can be terminated in the womb or upon birth if the mother chooses to do so. Some people come at this point of view and promote it because they feel like it is the best thing to do for the mother. And I can understand why we would want to, especially in certain circumstances, really want to help mothers who are in situations that are not of their own choosing but that does not give us the right to take human life for no reason. This ideology claims that it is the best, it is in the best interest of the mother who may not have wanted to become pregnant, although that is not always the case. In fact, in our country today, there are approximately 2,600 abortions every day. Approximately 62 million abortions have been performed legally in this country since January 23, 1973, when the Supreme Court gave its ruling, making abortion legal across the land. Unfortunately, a growing percentage of those abortions have been chosen by women and men who pressure them into getting abortions, who regularly attend church and claim to be Christians. I and far too many other pastors have been too quiet on this issue. I have always wanted to make sure that the messages you hear from God's word in this pulpit are what God wants us to hear. We need to hear this message, but at the same time, we cannot preach about this every single week. There is Bible studies, there are personal Bible studies, there are a variety of sermons and messages that you can hear from a variety of good pastors out there upon this topic, and I implore you to take advantage of all of them as often as you can. Many within the Christian church would agree that abortion is wrong, according to the Bible. But yet many find themselves in a situation in which they believe that abortion is their only choice. 
that is something that Christian churches and Christians need to address, and we are going to address that in a few minutes, but specifically need to address in a physical way as well as a spiritual way. For women who are in a crisis pregnancy, some of them have chosen life because churches and Christian ministries or somebody who believes in the gospel, believes in Jesus, came alongside them and said, we will help you through this pregnancy and we will help you to raise this child. And that is what is needed by a church community that says we are for life at all stages and ages. There may be some who hear this message today, either in person or online or in the future, who may... This may be a very personal issue, and today I am going to be very bold and strong about what the Bible teaches, because I believe that that is necessary, but it is not an indictment of you personally. I do hope that you see and hear and can understand truthfully what God's Word says, but I also hope and hear and pray that you hear God's heart for those who have sinned or have contemplated sin that he is willing to forgive and bring his grace and compassion to you and help you through his church, through the gospel, through the spirit, to live a life that honors him and honors life. I hope and pray that you hear that today, that it is not a personal attack against you at all, but I hope that it helps you to come forward if necessary, to find help if needed. And I hope and pray that our church would be that type of church that would offer that hope and help. First of all, this morning, I want us to see from the scriptures the clear teaching and understanding that human life is precious at all ages and stages, though our focus will be on the life of the unborn. Jesus repeatedly taught and made statements to the fact that he and his father value children at all ages and all stages of life and development. And true disciples will defend and protect those who cannot protect themselves, particularly meaning the unborn, but even the elderly who cannot fend for themselves. Life is a gift from God that should be protected, valued, and defended and honored. And Jesus had some very stern words for those who would harm children in any way, shape, or form. We're not going to go to those passages today. We're going to focus mostly on uh, Old Testament passages today. Uh, and for our message this morning, two key points. First of all, that we value and promote life because God creates, created, creates, values, and protects life. God has from the very beginning and continues to do so, and that is the number one reason why we should as well. So we're going to look at Genesis 1, 26 through 28 to begin with, and I'm going to read through many passages today. I listed them out on your notes today, gave you plenty of room to write. I made the notes really big today so that they're hard to lose because of all the notes that I've given you over the years, this is a a set of notes I hope that you will keep and study and utilize in your conversations with people over this issue. If you have not grabbed those today, you can grab those on the way out, and they are in your email box as well. Uh, but I'm going to go through some of these passages rather quickly. I'm not going to read the whole passage, just what is pertinent to our topic today. And so forgive me if I move a little fast through reading them. I'm not trying to over cover anything or hide anything. I just want to get through a lot of material today. Genesis 1, 26-28. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. We're going to focus more on that in a couple of weeks. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue. God made, God created humanity in his image. And that is huge, that is key, that is vital. In fact, almost all of the issues that we're going to talk about over the next couple of weeks find their roots in the book of Genesis and often in these very verses themselves. And as our culture and as the Christian church moves away from the authority of Scripture, the sufficiency of Scripture, we face more and more of these issues because people are not grounded in the truth of God's Word. We were made in God's image and likeness with a purpose to rule over creation in His stead, to be His representatives. Being image bearers means that we're created to be like God in a fashion, not divine, not eternal, as in having no beginning and no end, but to know Him, and to carry out His purpose, and to worship Him. 
God created humanity male and female and commanded that they would have children and fill the earth with more image bearers. This is a sign that he values life, human life. I want more human beings all over the world honoring and glorifying my name. That was part of the point for creation. He wants the whole world filled with people. And to forcibly deny humanity the opportunity or ability to have children goes against God's commands and God's purpose. To kill an unborn or recently born child is to be disobedient to God's commands, to be fruitful and multiply, let alone to not murder. Genesis 2.7 continues this. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. God formed humanity out of the ground. He put his hands in the dirt that he spoke into existence. And he fashioned that dirt in such a way that a human being would be created. Then he breathed into this first human so that he would be a living being. The only reason humanity exists is because God gave us life. He values that life and he protects that life. So we see that God created, he made. These are verbs. God is active in the creation of every single human being from the beginning and all the way through to the very final human who will ever be born. He created, he formed the body and breathed life, creating and giving spirit and soul in the first man. Genesis continues in verse 20 through 24 of chapter 2. So the man, I gave names to all the livestock. Adam, there was no suitable helper found. Adam got to see all of the animals, all the male and female pairs, but there was no pair for there was nobody there for Adam. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Verse 23, the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, a woman and they will become one flesh. More on that in the future as well. But for this morning, God caused Adam to realize and understand that he was different. There was something missing from his existence, and that was a helpmate, a woman in his life. So God took a part of Adam and made, he made a woman from Adam, which was made from the earth. So it's not just men who are made in, you know, by God's hands. Women as well was made from God's hands. Women are valued by God just as much as men. And we need to make sure that that is a message that is communicated as well. God values all life, male and female. Not one is greater than the other. He created the woman to be with him, to help him and support him. Women, you are valuable to us. And men, you better make sure that they understand that. Your daughters, your granddaughters, nieces, we need to make sure that we uphold God's word and help everybody to understand that they are all valuable in God's eyes. Humanity was complete and more image bearers could be created because Adam and Eve were now a couple, married together, united into one flesh and one spirit. God creates the most basic and most important building block of any society, the family, with a husband and a wife father and the mother, one man, one woman, in the bonds of marriage. And if that is ever broken, society will fall apart. History has proven that, and it is proving it even now. The family unit, the most basic building block of a society, should be protected and honored and lifted up. This is so awesome of a thing, and we could get into the nitty-gritty details of biology and all that kind of stuff, but that's for another time and another place. But one thing I want to highlight this morning is by turning to Psalm 139, verses 13 through 18. This is a familiar passage, famous passage that we often go to for uh, sanctity of life. I'm not going to go through the whole passage. I preached on this several years ago, but just a couple of verses here from Psalm 139, 13 through 18. David says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Notice the verbs. I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame, my skeleton, was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. 
when I was woven together, talking about weaving together the flesh, the body, arteries, veins, organs, all of those things, in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. King David is talking about in this chapter here, Psalm 139, about how awesome God is, how he can be everywhere, and he knows everything, and he's giving him praise, and he even gets down to the basic thing of life. You were there, you are there, whenever any human is created. From the very beginning of fertilization, conception, all the way through, you are there, God, and through the process that you have created, you are forming a human being. Life is precious to God. He created us. He watches over us. He is there in every intricate detail of life. And he even has plans for the unborn before they are even born. And the prophets Jeremiah, Isaiah, the Apostle Paul, the uh, John the Baptist, you know how often do we see this idea represented throughout all Scripture? John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit before he was ever born, meaning that he was a person who could be filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born. And in fact, as we've even talked about most recently with Jesus, his birth, his incarnation, the virgin birth, Mary, upon hearing the announcement and uh, being obedient to God's will and having the Holy Spirit overshadow her, she conceived almost immediately by the Holy Spirit what would become the Lord Jesus Christ. God protects the life that he values. When it says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, it's talking about reverently, respectfully. There is value, there is purpose, there is love for every single human that is ever created. God protects the life that he values. We see this most specifically in Genesis 9, verses 5 through 7. If you want to turn there real quickly. If not, it is the passage after the flood. Noah and his family and the animals, they're out of the ark. And God says, here's my promise to you. I'm never going to destroy the earth with the flood again. But, you have some things that you need to do. He says, for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal, and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth, and increase upon it. God takes life so seriously and considers it so precious that he instituted a covenant with Noah after the flood, stating that, no more of this willy-nilly, violent, murder-killing bloodshed. Now I'm giving permission to human beings to, in a proper fashion, through the establishment of human governments, to bring punishment upon those who commit violent acts of murder against other human beings. Even the animals God would call into account. Those who purposely take human life should pay for that sin with their own life. And not just willy-nilly, off the cuff. There should be a system established and put into place. We see God doing that throughout human history, especially with his own people, which we'll get at in a moment. God was trying to tell people and us today that even though human beings are imperfect and even though governments are imperfect, there should be a system which says no and that somebody pays for their crimes if they should take human life without due reason. This was meant by God to show that he values all life and that there will be just consequences for taking any human life without the proper process of the law system. Now, sometimes the law gets it wrong. Sometimes murderers do go free. Sometimes other violent criminals go free. But there will be a day of judgment for all. There's two types of judgment against sin. Upon the cross, and the great white throne judgment at the end of all things. Our sins can be taken care of at the cross. We don't have to pay for them at the cross. If we place our faith in Christ and what he did for us at the cross. But if we do not, then we will have to pay the price for our own sin and face judgment of eternal hell. God takes life seriously and he protects it. He has taken measures to protect it. One of those measures we find in Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 25. God is giving the law to Moses and to the people of Israel. They're at Mount Sinai. They've already come through the Red Sea, the tabernacle's been created, and all these systems and things for God's people. The law, ceremonial law, religious law, and political law is being established. 
And in Exodus 21, 22 through 25, we read this. If men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Israel was to protect innocent unborn life. God is establishing this principle of life for life for the nation of Israel. Now initially the idea is to, again, prevent unnecessary bloodshed. You cannot do anything more than what has been done to you. If somebody breaks your arm, then you cannot avenge them in any other way, shape, or form other than breaking their arm. Right? Otherwise, I mean, there would be blood feuds between people and clans and tribes and all this other stuff, and there would just be chaos and bloodshed everywhere. God is limiting punishment to the crime, and it must fit the crime, including capital punishment for killing the innocent unborn child. God took life and takes life very seriously in the shedding of innocent life, innocent blood, very seriously. Unfortunately, Israel did not always obey this. It's one of the reasons why they went into exiles, because they freely offered up to false gods their own children, causing them to be burned on an altar. God hated that. And so he kicked his people out of their promised land as punishment for taking innocent life. For God alone preserves the right to say how and when life will end. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I myself and he, he's talking about here, I am the Lord God. There is no God besides me, only Yahweh. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal and no one can deliver out of my hand. God is sovereign and he will bring true justice when he deems it necessary. He is the one who gets to say when life ends and when life does not end. He is the one who brings to life. He alone is responsible for those things. And how dare we as a society, as a people, ever say that we can do something that God has said no to. God, as creator, gets to decide who lives and who dies. And he can assign the authority to human governments to say, yes, in this situation, premeditated murder, yes, capital punishment, life life. So we value and protect life because God values and protects life. But we also value and protect life not only through laws, not only through standing firm upon God's truth, but also through grace and forgiveness. And that's what I want to focus on next because I believe that this has been a part of the message, the pro-life message that has often been neglected by the church. So much of our time for the rest of the day is going to be here. In this idea that we value and protect life through grace and forgiveness. If you think about it, turn to Romans 5 8. We just talked about this verse the other night in uh, our men's group. Romans 5 8, talking about love and how God has shown love and how we are supposed to show love. But the reason for God's love, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, we read this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still, what is that word? Sinners. Christ died for us. The gospel message is the greatest argument that there is for celebrating and protecting life. God shows us that life is precious and worthy of protection and honor in how he has provided salvation for Sinners. The Bible talks about how sinners are God's enemies. We are at odds with God. We are rebelling against God. We hate God unless we come to the realization that Christ is the Savior and that we need to repent of our sins when he calls us to that. God values human life so much that he would provide a way for rebellious sinners who are spiritually dead to have spiritual life and physical blessing in life through that to certain degrees. He sent Jesus, his one and only son, to pay the price for sin, so that no matter what sin anybody ever commits can be forgiven if they acknowledge and recognize that they are sinners who commit sin and it is against God and God alone, and that he forgives through faith in Christ, the, the way that he has provided for forgiveness 
and eternal life to be granted, fellowship to be granted once again. The gospel is the greatest answer to the problem of abortion in our country today. You want to change abortion in our country? Share the gospel. Help people understand that transformation in the human heart comes only through Jesus Christ and our faith in him. That is the greatest and the best way. Yes, we can pass laws, and that can help. But until the human heart is changed, laws are very, very weak at best. As believers, we must not forget this. God chose and provided a way for life for sinners, for rebels, to repent and believe, to be forgiven, and have eternal life. Women who choose to have an abortion and those who help them are committing a sin against God and the unborn child, and we need to acknowledge that. Unfortunately, we do need to present that bad news, as awful as that is, and how much that might even hurt somebody to hear that and to accept that they have done that. It is not an unforgivable sin. The only unforgivable sin is a sin that is not asked to be forgiven. If we do not ask for it to be forgiven, it cannot be, because we need to come to God knowing that he will forgive according to his word. Any sin can be forgiven by believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It requires an acknowledging of that sin, the fact that we are sinners by nature, and that only Jesus provided forgiveness by taking the punishment for our sin upon himself at the cross where he died. That he came back from the dead, having paid the full penalty, defeating death and the power of sin for those who would trust him and his finished work. Forgiveness is possible. New life, even after something as awful as an abortion, can happen. There is hope for every sinner, for every person. David in Psalm 51 is a great example of confessing and repenting of sin. I'm not going to read all of the those verses there, but he starts in Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, my sins, my law-breaking. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. He's acknowledging that I am a sinner to the core, and only you can forgive me. I know my transgressions, my sin is always before me, and against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. He goes on to talk about being sinful at birth and even being conceived in sin because they're sinners. Surely you desire truth. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Only God can wash us clean. Only he can provide something new in our hearts. A pure heart that renews a steadfast spirit to obey the Lord. The sacrifices of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, a heart that says, I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. Lord, forgive me. I believe in Christ and what he has done at the cross. I believe he is your son. And through faith, my faith in him, I can be forgiven and have eternal life. That is the message that we need to proclaim. That is the number one argument for ending abortion. People need to know that there is hope. Hope for Sin, all sin, but also hope for afterwards. There may be consequences for our sinful actions, but that is not the same as punishment for our sins. Yes, it will be a struggle. Life will be. After we commit a sin and seek forgiveness, there's going to be consequences in life because every action that we commit and make has consequences. It affects our life and everybody else's, and we're just going to have to live with that, but the Lord can help us through those things. Jesus talks about forgiveness, forgiving those who have sinned against us. When he teaches his disciples to pray in Matthew 6, he says, forgive us our debts as we, as, all, as we also have forgiven our debtors. If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. Us accepting forgiveness means that we're going to forgive others. And if we're not willing to forgive others, that could be a sign that we have truly not accepted the forgiveness given to us by God. God, through Christ. We are to seek forgiveness, and we should forgive. In fact, in Matthew 18, well, in other passages, Christ talks about how often we are to forgive. Matthew 18 talks about that, verse 22. Not seven times, but 77 times, meaning every single time somebody asks for forgiveness, we are to forgive. Forgiveness is to be given by the church. Unfortunately, those who commit some of the most grievous sins in our culture, in our society, find themselves to be the ones who cannot be forgiven because the church does not even allow them to come into the doors to find the true source of forgiveness. 
for far too long. There has been shame against those who have committed sexual immorality, abortion, homosexuality. That has got to change. Yes, we stand against sin and we say sin is wrong, but we also say there is forgiveness. There's a way out of sin and a way to have sins paid for by Christ and not ourselves. We need to offer forgiveness. But in the church, there are times when even believers fall into sin. And Christ has provided an opportunity for that to be dealt with. And he talks about that in Matthew 18, 15 through 22. We are to work with people who sin. And if that doesn't work right away, then we bring it to the church leadership and then to the church in the hopes of restoring and bringing people to repentance. Not to beat them up with truth, but to bring them to repentance. There should be much grace and forgiveness and compassion in that process that we call church discipline, bringing people back into line with God's way of life. Even the Apostle Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 5-11. through 11. There was a man who committed a grievous sin. He was involved in a sexual relationship with his father's wife. Paul said, you need to deal with that, and that man needs to be kicked out of the church if he will not repent. But then eventually they treated him so harshly and so strongly that Paul's like, hey, it's time to let up. He's asked for forgiveness, he's repented, he's shown signs of the fruit of repentance, so forgive him and bring him back into your fellowship that he might not be destroyed. We need to be careful how far we go with bringing the truth of sin into people's lives. Yes, we present it, we call people to account, but we do so with grace and compassion and mercy. We need to allow the church to graciously, meekly, gently lead us and guide us towards repentance. If we do not repent of sin, then we can expect the church to break fellowship until we do repent and embrace grace and forgiveness in Jesus. And as we learned last week, our approach to those who have sinned or believe in false teaching must be with meekness and gentleness and humility. But sin must be confronted with truth. We don't have to be jerks. We don't have to be mean about it. We just state the truth according to the gospel and we let the Spirit work in people's lives. We stand firm, but with grace and compassion. With confession, when confession and repentance have occurred, we offer forgiveness and full support in any way, shape, or form that we can. We're commanded by the apostles throughout the New Testament to, as Ephesians 4.32 says, to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. The little sins that we commit towards each other all the time, but also the major sins. And yes, even the world. If someone were to come in here not knowing Christ yet, but they've committed sin and they felt compelled to be here today or any church or any way, shape, or form they might hear the truth of the gospel, we need to be ready and willing to forgive them of their sin when they know truth and they submit to the truth of Christ. To behave like Jesus in John 8, 1 through 11. The woman caught in adultery. Jesus was the only one who could condemn her in that situation. And he chose to say, go and sin no more. He offered her grace he offered her compassion. We're to be a forgiving and compassionate people for all who claim faith in Christ. We're able to do that because of what God has done for us through Christ. So when dealing with sin in the church, we always teach and present God's truth about all sin and why God calls it sin and what a holy life looks like. We also keep in mind that there will be sin in the church. We've got to remember this. There's going to be people who fall back into temptation, who give in to pressure for whatever reason. And hopefully the reason that, hopefully we can take away the number one reason why most Christians choose abortion. Because they're afraid of what their church and their pastors are going to respond. That's the number one reason why most Christians choose abortion. Because they're afraid of how they're going to be treated at church. Yes, we are strong with sin, but we are also just as strong with grace and mercy and compassion. We must have an attitude of sensitivity and understanding as pastors and as churches when we react and respond to sin. People in the church who sin need to know what to expect from their pastor and their church. They should expect us to treat them the way that Christ treats all sinners, with forgiveness and grace and kindness that's meant to lead them to repentance and a restored relationship with Christ and his church. Is everybody always going to understand that? No. And unfortunately, even many in our church today, not in our church, but in the church today, they don't want to have anything to do with any sort of authority. You can't tell me I've done something wrong. 
The reason they feel that way many times is because of the guilt that they have. They don't want to address that or deal with that. It's keeping them from finding the hope and the healing that they need and can only find in Christ. So this morning, if any of us, young or old, have committed any sin at all, I trust and hope that you would be a people that would offer grace and forgiveness and hope and feel that you can come to your pastor and your elders and say, I've fallen and I need help. I've sinned. Help me to come back to a place where I can walk with my Lord in a holy way that honors and glorifies him. And I know that there has been sin within the church in the past. I don't know how that's always been dealt with. I wasn't here and I cannot speak to that. But I can speak to what happens from now on. And we will be a church that offers grace and forgiveness while standing firm upon the word of God, of course. So to wrap this up, in taking captive the ideology of the pro-abortion view, we find it inconsistent with the word of God, period. There is no way, shape, or form that anybody could ever say from the scriptures that abortion is good and should be done. No reason whatsoever. We believe that the scriptures teach that God alone creates life and has the authority to take it away and give authority to those, humanly speaking, that he allows to take away life in a legal way because they've done a crime, they've committed some wrong. Innocent children have done no wrong. They have not yet had the opportunity to. God has declared how human authorities may take life as a form of just punishment. I just said it. Forgive me. We believe that God is also a God of forgiveness, grace, and compassion towards sinners. That all sin, including that of abortion, is forgivable if confessed and repented of by faith in Jesus' sacrifice on behalf of sinners. We believe that the church is to offer forgiveness, grace, and compassion towards repentant sinners, striving to live a life of holiness after falling into sin. Somebody comes to us and says, hey, I've fallen in this way, you know, and now I'm pregnant, and I know that there's the, you know, there's all these options out there, but I don't want to go that way. I don't want to add another sin upon the sin I've already committed. Forgive me. Help me to move forward. I want to live a life that honors Christ. And we will help that individual, that woman, to do so. We believe that the church should strive to support women who choose life along with those who are striving to honor the Lord. And by this I mean whether they are a believer or not, if they choose life to not have an abortion, even if they're not a Christian, we should support them in that fact. That they have chosen life in any way, shape, or form we can. I'm not saying that we've got to empty out our piggy banks and we've got to empty out our bank account in the church. But if necessary, yes. But it shouldn't come to that. But we should be able to somehow aid and support anyone who chooses life at all ages and all stages. We will love all women who become pregnant, believer or unbeliever. We will not shame, tease, or kick out any repentant sinner. Now somebody is like, forget that, man. I don't care about what God's Word says. And say, okay, when you do care, you can feel free to come back. But until then, you're not going to mock God's Word and God's truth and God's people by your flagrant disrespect for the truth and the opportunity to find forgiveness and grace and hope that he has offered to you. There may be a time we need to say that, but if someone is repentant and willing, seeking help, we offer that help immediately. We will celebrate life, provide needed resources, and care for the new mother and baby as we are able. Whether they're a member, whether they're a tender, whether they're an unbeliever or not, if they need help, we will provide that help. As pastor, I'm asking our church leadership to determine the best way for us as a church to at least financially support, if not serve, at some gospel-based ministry supporting women in crisis pregnancy. As far as I know, the church has not done this on a regular basis. I'm calling the church to do this on a regular basis. We need to put our money in our walk where our talk is. I would like this to be decided upon by our first quarterly business meeting in April. However way this needs to be done, through missions, through elders, through church vote, through ch I don't care where the money comes from, but we will find, and I can help us find, I've got a couple in mind already, gospel-based ministries that help women in, with crisis pregnancies, leading many of them to faith in Christ and helping them to raise or give up their babies for, for adoption. 
We need to become a part of this battle, at least in this way, if not also finding a place where we can go and serve hands-on in some way, shape, or form so that we can defend life, especially the most innocent and vulnerable life. This is a mission field. We should embrace it as such. May we be a church that defends life as a corporate body, but also as individuals. And there is so much more that I could have shared today. We could have gone into the Gospels, so many other places. But I hope and know and pretty much am aware of where everybody stands on this issue. But I hope that this message today has given you some biblical foundation for standing firm about this. Because it's very easy to eventually be pressured into caving in to something. Do not cave in on this issue. There's a reason this is first. Not just because it's Sanctity of Life Sunday. But because this is one of the most vital issues that the church is facing in our nation. We must stand firm in defending life according to God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for creating us. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for the examples and the teachings of your word and for the help that we receive through it and your spirit. Help us to be a church that defends life properly according to your word. For everyone, the unborn from the moment of fertilization, conception, all the way through, even to the elderly and the aged. May we support life as we are able. Help us as a church father to decide the best way, shape, or form to support and defend life within our community, within our state, and our nation. However you lead us to do that, Father, I pray that we would take this torch and that we would run with it with gusto. Help us to be a church and a people that is forgiving of those who are seeking help seeking forgiveness. May we offer the hope of the gospel in all situations. Give strength and courage and boldness, gospel wisdom, spirit-filled wisdom to our leadership and to all who come through these doors to serve. To those family members, co-workers, neighbors that we meet every day who are struggling with the choice of life, we pray that you would help us to guide them and direct them into the hope of the gospel and helping them to defend life. And again, Father, for those here today who hear my voice through this message, through this recording, for those who have, in some way, shape, or form, been affected by abortion, Father, I pray that you would touch their hearts, encourage them, help them to know that hope, forgiveness, a new life is available to them through the cross of Christ and through your word, through your grace. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Take your hymnals with me if you would this morning, please. Turn to 299, Him Rescued the Perishing. We as a church are commanded by our Lord and Savior to go and to proclaim the gospel, teaching all people everywhere to follow His word. May this be our commitments to that today, singing this song together. Rescue the Perishing. First verse of prayer. grace and mercy you've offered us. We pray that we would live in that today and throughout this week. 
Bring us together soon again, we pray, to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. We're dismissed.